Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our live webinar with Q&A. It is Technologies of the Future. And this morning, we are going to talk about International Youth Day and the convergence of the rising billion, which uh, from the developing nations, there's a lot of youth. I would like to read a passage this morning from the book Bold from Peter Diamandis and Seva Kotler. And I'm on chapter seven around crowdsourcing. It's the fall of 2000. There are now more than 20 million websites on the internet. The browser wars, AOL versus Netscape are in full swing. And with the recent bursting of the dot-com bubble, there are out, a lot of out of work graphic designers hanging around cyberspace, just looking for something to do. Jack Nickel and Jacob DeHart are among them. Nickel and DeHart are both 19 years old. They too are out of work designers. They met during an online t-shirt design, design competition something that was then occasionally starting to happen and decided they wanted such contests to happen more frequently. Instead of a competition just once a year, they decided to create a website that hosted them once a week. Anyone with a good t-shirt design could enter. Everyone in the community could vote and the winner got $100 and the winning t-shirt was put up for sale on the site. They named their new venture threadless.com and mostly it seemed harmless enough. Turns out, People liked to vote on T-shirts. They really liked to vote on T-shirts. Within a few years, Threadless was turning an annual profit of north of $20 million, almost unintentionally. Nickel and DeHart had become the third largest T-shirt manufacturers in the United States. And Threadless wasn't alone in finding ways to tap into the begoing online community. During this same time, a software designer named Philip Rosedale noticed that the hardcore gamers weren't just interested in playing games. They also seemed to want to spend their time designing the games themselves. So he created Second Life, a massive virtual world that was essentially built for free with Rosedale merely outsourcing software development to the gaming crowd. And the crowd, as Jeff Powell wrote in Wired, was only too eager to do the work. So eager, in fact, that throughout the early 2000s, the Second Life community generated 10,000 gamer hours worth of content a day. An entire economy emerged inside the game. Right around the time that Threadless was starting to make 20 million in annual profits, Business World put Ashni Chung on the cover, the very first virtual citizen who had become a real life millionaire because of his Second Life business. And so, uh, this trend is continuing. Let's uh, bring online some experts this morning to discuss the convergence of the rising billion and International Youth Day. Oh, we got, we've got Christina this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I believe Andrew is joining us. It's Andrew is in the house. Yeah. Incredible. How are you this morning? What's a one word opener? Calm. I don't know where it's coming from, but calm is my one word opener. I love it. And we've got Andrew, but we do not have uh, his video. Uh, we, we don't have my video, and I'm trying to work out, <laughs> work out why. Bear with me a moment. All right. I'm going to go with warm this morning because I did have the air conditioning set in here. It's winter. I don't know what degrees it is outside, but it's 25 in here, and it's quite toasty. <laughs> so my word this morning is warm. Quite cool outside. There you are, Andrew. M mine is nostalgic because oh. I didn't realise Second Life was still there. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> I, I believe so. I haven't been on there, but um, it's it's doing well, as well as a lot of Web3 companies that are actually spinning up now and creating new worlds and, and uh, a lot of people are living in the metaverse, whether it be yeah. virtual reality or augmented reality, there's all sorts of things that are being created. I have to ask, what's your second life experience? Uh, pr probably as a, well, it was just in the post dial up stage. I was having a play around, well, we're going back 15 years, <laughs> uh, how, having a look at the metaverse. I, I, I never really bought property or do the things that you, that, you know, people, uh, some people just dedicated their time to it. Uh, but it was just such a cool concept to have almost, almost this weird concept to have uh another world where you would digitally express and and live yourself uh, you know live this alternate life um uh and yeah it was quite quite a novelty 
I guess if we look back, there was, there was a time when Facebook and social media didn't exist. You could browse the websites, but that was it. And so in our youth, uh, you know, when I was young, oh, my goodness, I just said that. Uh, it's true. Um, you know, we didn't have, have things like social media, and we do actually immerse ourselves in that world, which is another world. It's a digital world now in our lives. Christina. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, Andrew, when you were in, in, in the platform, on the platform, yeah. Were you who you are, or did you create the person that you, are of, of, you know, your daydreams, imaginations? Look, I, I'd like to think I was who I am, <laughs> but but the reality is, yeah, I um, look. I, I would probably go, you know, th th thinking back, I was probably a lot more confident and expressive than I would be in face to face interactions, um, because I think you 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 could. Uh, express yourself in such a way that uh, you wouldn't have the confidence in in perhaps a a face to face setting, um, and just putting, for example, um, you know, you might be uh, a kid who's bullied at school, or a kid who might have uh, might living in in a remote town, uh, and that at, at that point in time when you know you were restricted to your suburb, your town, your neighborhood, really. Uh, you would get exposure and experiences and, and a connectedness to people who might not be those that are geographically around you. Uh, and, th and that was quite cool. Yeah, I think, I think that whole concept, the whole psychology uh, behind it is quite fascinating for me. Mm. Mm. And yeah. so... I guess for International Youth Day, let's, let's talk about the youth. And, uh, you know, in Australia, we are very blessed in a number of ways. And International Youth Day does highlight a number of challenges around the world. And uh, I love there was a highlight on the youth in Ukraine and some of the other social and legal issues that are facing youth today. So, you know, I'd love to sort of talk about, um, I guess, from an Australian perspective, you know, what are the challenges of youth in Australia, do you think? And uh, Christina, you have kids. How do you, how have you navigated the mindset of kids here and, you know, given them contrast or perspective to what happens internationally? Perfectly, I've navigated my children. Um, I don't know. I, one of my favourite lines, actually, or one of the lines, not my favourite lines, but one of the lines that comes out of my mouth more often is that I'm new to this uh, as well and we're all navigating something new and something different. Uh, I, I think there's a, a, I feel, I don't know how they will feel, but I feel less generational with my children than I felt with my parents I felt they were, and then again with my grandparents. So it'll be interesting to have that um, that more specific conversation with them to find out what a generational gap means. But I, I find there's um, much more less expectation from me and more encouragement. Uh, and that's not to say that I didn't have the most amazing upbringing and the most encouraging, wonderful parents who who instilled confidence. But I find that instead of pulling them towards um, something, I try to open open things up for them and give them different experiences. And I'm not sure that I've answered your question, but it's a, such a long, complicated question and I'm still learning. You actually touched on a great point there around, um, you know, you didn't feel the gap of the generations. And uh, I kind of look at it's um, the theme today is creating a world for all ages. And so stopping ageism. And I was actually at a talk a number of years ago and it was from HubSpot, actually. It was the HubSpot CEO, I think, and they were talking about um, uh, recruiting a number of really young people and they had young people in senior management positions and he had a great saying. He said, actually, you know, there's been, there's a number of youth and younger people who are actually very wise and responsible human beings and there's a lot of older people who are not wise and responsible and so it was a nice... Um, I guess, contrast to be able to go, well, actually, it's individualism and we're going into an age of hyper-personalisation and so it actually isn't it about age anymore. And, um, you know, certainly for us, we don't notice it too much because we work with people of all ages and I love having kids through our programs and through to, you know, older people, if you were just talking on age through our programs, and I think a lot of the concepts that we talk about are relevant to all ages. 
and that's been around mindset technology and impact and with the right mindset and abundance mindset anyone can make a difference in this world that's right and also if you look back to the tribes the ancient tribes it wasn't it wasn't one or the other the wisdom of the elders was actually revered um but the exuberance and the energy of the youth it converged with that you know and as you say it is the age of hyper personalization everything is um, is coming to its own unique like what are the unique skills everybody brings and that doesn't matter what age you are we all have those unique gifts so let's talk a little bit more about the rising billion so I loved in the book bold we're talking about crowdsourcing and we've spoken a lot um, there's a huge trend towards um, being hard to recruit for specific roles and so with the high-speed internet with a lot more people internationally having access to devices and fast internet we can actually outsource quite a lot of work and create economic opportunities internationally for youth as well and the t-shirt example was a great one I love 99 designs if we we're going to do a logo going out and 99 dollars it's actually about 200 dollars now if you want to you know get the special features and all the rest but you can get 500 logos in 24 hours of designs submitted from people all around the world and so there's it's not just those simple tasks and this book was released a number of years ago now so I'm sort of looking at some of the new technologies and one of the winners of the Extreme Tech Challenge Web 3 competition was Mona and they are a platform that allows you to create your own metaverse so you can go on there and you develop and you create a metaverse on their platform and so I think you know for any business how do you utilize that and how do you utilize this international talent to be able to do some of those tasks and bring some of those skills that you might not have within your own organization. I believe Good. we have Dr. Ken Young joining us this morning. He's able to turn his camera on if he wants to join the conversation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Christina. Good to meet you Hello. all. Long time no see. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Hi, I'm well, at home today. I'm dressed rather casually, but I thought I dropped in and, you know, um, listened to some pose of wisdom, always from our lovely Lisa and Christina. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And I was given an opportunity to come online and I thought, oh, well, let's join a conversation, shall we? <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely. And, and so we were just talking um, uh, around the rising billion and, and outsourcing. Um, Christina, Andrew, Ken, any thoughts? Yeah, well, with our, with our say, for example, with, with, with my company, um, we started this six, six or so years ago. Um, and so I, I, every, everyone in our, in our team was remote. Uh, we had a computer linguist in San Francisco, graphic designer in Florida, uh, developers in Eastern Europe, um, uh, psych, psych consultants who, who would design surveys and personality analysis and, and you know, all, all the cool meaty algorithms uh, coming out of uh, the UK. And uh, uh, we had uh, staff members in, in the Netherlands as well. It, for a business, it makes absolute sense because you're no longer looking at a pool of candidates within you know, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, whatever someone can physically travel. Your talent pool is the world. Um, so, so for companies that restrict themselves unnecessarily, not, not where it's necessary, unnecessarily to, they must be in the office and I want them here. It just doesn't make sense to me. I, I cannot fathom why you would limit the, your your resources to such a small narrow pool. Um, but also, the I think a, as a company we've grown because culturally everyone brings a different aspect. And yeah, our staff have uh, have people from uh, you know who, who are north north of fifty five. Uh, and our de developers that, that are sort of south of, of 25. Um, and the ability for us to, to learn both ways, um, you know, the, the wisdom of, of, of the elders and the exuberance of the youth uh, has, has lifted all of us uh, and given all of us knowledge, enthusiasm, uh, and an understanding, um, particularly driven by, by youth who can mitigate the cynicism of the older ones. 
uh, you know, when you marry those things together, it can work beautifully. It's funny you say that, Andrew, because I often find that it's the, the that it's the optimism of the older ones that mitigates the cynicism of the youth. So it, it is like this whole cross cultural um, uh, cross idea thing. I, and the other thing I find too, so I love that that we can go out and get any specialist in any field that we want, and I find that extremely empowering that somebody can sit within their speciality. But I also love the fact that. Um, within an organisation, you are no longer restricted in your little silo. So just because you come on as a graphic designer in an organisation doesn't mean that you can't learn um, other skills and be developing event, you know, event um, uh, acquisition of knowledge, etc. So I, th I think there's this this mix. Like let's just look at people for their unique skills and not define them into a job role. For starters, is one of my one of one of the ways that, that um, I've always worked with staff in my employ. Um, because I think that is really special as well. To, to nut someone into a silo is so restricting mm. uh, and, and so limiting. Yeah. I was going to say, and I concur with, uh, you know, Andrew and what you've shared, Christina, we have um, uh, employees from right across uh, Southeast Asia, um, China, and also in India, because uh, with Borderless Healthcare Group, we were essentially a tech healthcare tech company that brings healthcare to the home. And we have developers managing Indian um, youth and, and full of, you know, exuberance and enthusiasm. And, you know, you, you were sharing that cynicism in the But in Asia at the moment when the economies are growing so fast, they're full of hope and optimism. It's the exact opposite of what we see in the youth in, in the West, which is really quite an interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, and they bring a different take on things. And, and there is, they've got that, you know, can do mental attitude. They just want to get things done. You know, nothing's going to stop them. It's just, yeah, it's infectious. I wonder how the actual population statistics impact that because I know the average age in some of the, the Western cultures is higher than some of those in the developing countries. So, for example, average age in India, I believe, is about 18. In Africa, it's about 28. In the US, it was yeah. about 28, uh, about 38, sorry. And so, um, and there's a direct correlation to the number of births per mother as well. So in some of these developing nations, they're having a lot more children. And then as the, yep. the aging population grows on, and I think um, people are, are starting to have less babies. And so, you know, the youth, we're seeing that we've got this huge amount of youth in the population that are willing and able and have that attitude, like you say, Ken. So, you know, how do we tap into some of that and give them opportunities where they can create economic opportunities for their families wherever they live? It's so empowering to see the opportunities that's open up. And some of our staff have been with us since the start of our company, which is almost 12 years ago, 14 years ago, you know, and they've stayed with us and they've worked through the ranks. And, you know, uh, it's fantastic to see that. It's, it's really, and also... We, we are, you know, because we've got staff in, say, the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Singapore, um, in China and, and in India, um, and some developers that we hire out in, in Eastern Europe, we, we learn so much from them as well. It's amazing that we learn about their cultures as well and how they work and how they think. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to build a global company, you really, really need to understand all these different markets and, and the way people think. Yeah. And so if we move on to the impact that we can have, so, you know, for the next five minutes or so, what do you see as the biggest opportunities and what actions would you love to see people taking in this space? Christina? So I'd like to go back to um, to the youth and we're running a, a youth entrepreneurship program um, with a school who I, I won't name. Uh, and what I'm finding extremely impactful about what's happening within, just within this, this classroom walls for two hours, um, you know, in after hour classes, is that is the peak in curiosity. So I think that, A, that is a really good impact of where we are at the moment, but also the impact, the ongoing ripple effect impact that that's going to have. If you can create those curious minds, uh, and then if that reflects throughout a whole organisation and throughout all ages, cultures, races, nations, whatever classifications you want to put on somebody, um, I think that will be the best of bringing 
you know, every single aspect of what is good uh, and what will take us forward and what, what will help us innovate, etc. So for me, I know it's not an exact answer to the question that you're asking, but the impact for me um, has been that curiosity and the and the flow on impact effect that that's that's going to have. So I think that's something that I would really love to um, to encourage everybody to do: ask questions, engage in conversation, particularly with youth. Mm -hmm. Andrew, uh, I uh, sorry, I might digress from your question a bit, but further to what you, you said, Christina, what I what I love, and I think we can do to it to empower the youth uh, at the moment is let them be. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely love is the activism and the moral position that uh, you know, we, we see coming up. A lot of uh, change around uh, equality, around climate, around defining what is right, around defining what a company companies can and should do and not do for profit at the cost of something else really has been pushed by the under 30s. You know, back, back in the in the 90s and 2000s, you had Milton Freeman uh, idea that uh, you know, a company is there for profit and it's up to the shareholders to do any social good, nothing to do with the company. That's changed completely. And now we're at the point where uh, uh, companies and profits are, are coupled directly to the surroundings around that. Uh, the idea of equality and inclusiveness is really being driven by, uh, by, by the youth. Let them keep going. Ken, thoughts on the opportunity Indeed, I, and actions? Yeah, I, I, think, I think for me, the mental health aspect of youth is important, um, often not paid attention to. Um, we live in a world where, you know, sometimes it would look like we're just compete, out, trying to outcompete each other. Whereas, you know, if the youth gets, comes together and work together, they get better outcome. And, and there is this concept in the capitalistic world that, you know, the winner takes all, but it's really not like that. We're all, inter, you know, interdependent to each other. And uh, I think, you know, the, the concept of uh, stakeholdership rather than just shareholdership, you know, everything just for the shareholder of the company and not the stakeholders, which is what Andrew was, I believe, was alluding to, you know, mm -hmm. what happens around people, you know, uh, supply chain, your workers, obviously your employees, employers, uh, everything, the whole stakeholdership, I think you need to teach youth about all that, you know, and, and, and working together and you know, not just a winner takes all mentality. Uh, and, and because that at one point you will burn out, you know, you will burn out one day. And how do you rescue yourself from that? You know, all that sort of thinking. Yeah, I think youth, uh, the mentorship program at school is so important. I think it's such a thing that I would like to, you know, be doing something here in Victoria, you know, in the private school, starting with that perhaps, and then moving on to the other schools. I think it's so important. Yeah, you remind me of a book that I totally love and would recommend anyone interested to read. It's by Dr. June Young and it's Inclusive Stakeholding. And it's mm. how we all have a stake in the future of the planet and people and all the rest and it's a unique mindset. And I think towards the, you know, whether it be um, mentorship and private schooling or public schooling, I'd love to see parents taking an interest of um showing contrast and just exposing their kids to a lot of different thoughts and so there's a lot of information out there in the world and how do you how do you as a parent know what to share and so for me I love the Khan Academy K-H-A-N Academy and when I was living in Silicon Valley I was just so surprised because almost all of my colleagues at work there their kids were doing the Khan Academy as well as school. They were using that as homework for their kids and just to be able to get additional information in there and additional access to worldwide information and learning. So I know um, we've spoken about as well Elon Musk's school and uh, Baby Julius, the, the entry exam to get into that school was a quite fun game to play and see if you could beat the computer on that. But there are a lot of resources out there now that we are connected to the internet. And I think that's what excites me when we talk about uh, the developing nations and the rising billion. Uh, I love the UNICEF Giga Connect project and they're actually working on making sure all of the schools that have been funded by UNICEF are connected to the internet and so they've got a real-time dashboard of internet connectivity 
And so, you know, how do we actually um, give every every young person, every person, an equal access to be able to participate in this online economy? And I think the infrastructure is getting there and we've never had a time like this to be able to make the most of that and ensure that it's fair and equitable and that we're sharing great information. I'm also going to move us a little bit into the technology because you've just reminded me about the X Prize, Lisa, as well. So the, the um, education prize where the target was to develop an app that would give um, children in third world countries basic literacy and numeracy skills without the intervention of an adult. Uh, and that has that succeeded. It has been it's in third world countries. Um, they've had the, um, uh, technology donated so that they could work it. And apparently some of the reports coming back are just the intuitiveness of, of the children um, on the devices, for starters, uh, but then mm. to navigate their way around the apps as well. And that was part of the criteria. You had, had to be quite navigatable. Uh, but if we can educate, as you say, that education, that curiosity, that connectivity, if we can have that happening globally, um, that's just going to lift, you know, help everybody lift at the same time. I am going to ask you all for a vision of the future because we are getting to the close of our time this morning. And so the question is, it's the year 2042. You've just woken up based on our conversation around International Youth Day and the rising billion. What does the world look like? Andrew. Uh, the, the youth that we've uh, we've just been talking about are now in their 50s and 60s. <laughs> <laughs> and grappling with the same questions about what to do with, with the, the next generation. I think um, uh, um, I, I, I love the idea of, of mental health being an issue that would probably be ameliorated by then. Not, you know, it may never be treated well, but things that, um, that do cause us uh, distress and dysfunction um, uh, that are within our control have, have, been, have been fixed and well-being has, has, has risen. Ken? Oh, um, I'm a, a really bad futurist, but I, I think youth waking up to the morning and having a dashboard of, you know, uh, 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 not just their physical health, but even their mental status, you know, and saying to them, okay, you've slept poorly last night. So, you know, your, your behavior, you might be kind of a bit more susceptible to certain sort of mental stresses and this and that, maybe avoid this, maybe avoid that. Um, and then, you know, to maybe take a day off or have your afternoon off if you can, or we'll reschedule your meeting for tomorrow. Technology coming in, helping the youth and, you know, helping everyone. Um, and not just looking at the physical space, I think looking at the mental space in, in all of that. I think that's, yeah, I think that's, that would be ideal if we could achieve it that way, yeah. I love it, Ken, and I think the future is faster than you think because my aura ring tells me I'm a 97% today. <laughs> and uh, just to make sure I get that in, I am ready to take on whatever challenge is thrown at me. <laughs> I love it. I can... So, yeah, I absolutely am certain that'll exist. Christina. Uh, so in my vision um, of, of that era, we, have, we no longer refer to people as young, old, um, we no longer refer to race or gender. We are respectful and we embrace everybody for their individuality and who they are. Uh, and we are all, all on an equal plane, all able to contribute in the best way, bringing our unique special gifts in the best way we possibly can to better um, society and the planet. I love it. For me, in the year 2042, I think we actually learn differently. And, you know, we, we haven't really touched on this too much this morning, so I'm going a little bit off track. But, you know, maybe we have um, superimposed information and we've got expanded neocortexes or we've got brain-computer interfaces and we're able mm. to have a different perspective on the world. That is going to bring all new challenges. But I guess, you know, the youth are actually going to be creating these technologies. So let's nurture them and love them now and um, help bring them into um, being very young, lovely, responsible adults who are going to be creating these mm. technologies and looking after the elderly. Uh, although we're not going to age, maybe we cover that on a future topic. Yeah. <laughs> With that, I will uh, start to wrap us up. Andrew, you're going to chime in then? No, no, I was, I was just uh, preparing for the, for the closing. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, done. Yeah, just just waiting for that longevity. I am um, still 39, and actually, and actually, before we wrap up, everyone, I encourage you to go to population.io, punch in your date of birth, see where you fit into that international population database, and enjoy your day. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning for this conversation. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Haley. Behind the scenes, thank you everyone who's joined us live here on Zoom as well as on LinkedIn now live and in our online learning community. Have a wonderful Friday all. Bye everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. See you. Yeah.